High Queen Morghese of Andor has issued the following proclamation. The following discussion will include spoilers from the Wheel of Time books by Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson. We ask that you read those books so that our discussion does not spoil you. You have been warned, so it is written, so shall it be done. Hey. Welcome back to Bustin' Blockbusters. This is the companion piece to our non-book reader friendly review. This is a book reader friendly review of season two, episodes one and two of The Wheel of Time, A Taste of Solitude and Strangers and Friends. If you want any more information about that, then please go back to our prior podcast and we'll give you all of the deets about who wrote it, who directed it, and all that. It's Thomas Knapper is the director, and I believe Amanda Kate Schumann wrote the first episode, and Catherine B. McKenna wrote the second episode. But we want to focus specifically on some book things that actually go beyond the scope of where Priscilla had read. I'm going to do this part first, and then we'll have a little bit of a conversation with Priscilla at the end regarding our impressions of how the television show adapted some of these things. As we get started, I am going to offer you just one additional book spoiler, because I know some of you may have started the books, but you're not all the way through them. Things that I discuss in this section will be up to and including book seven, and maybe even a little bit beyond. So if you haven't read the entire series, you may want to lay off some of this, or if you want to dive in deeper, I mean, who am I to judge or avoid this podcast altogether? I don't blame you there because really my book thoughts aren't going to be any different than anybody else who's read the books. Some of the podcasts out there have read them multiple times and they're all much better at interpreting it than me. But just as kind of a time capsule of where I am in relation of my fandom, to this series and to this series of books, I wanted to do this section as we go through these episodes one and two and just point out some nice Easter eggs or overall story supplementary stuff. The first thing that I want to bring up actually comes up from Moraine, and I mentioned this in the non-book reader podcast, but I wanted to emphasize on it further. The whole story about land throwing Moraine into the pond is from A New Spring, as any of you book readers probably know if you've read that far. Now, New Spring is a prequel that I believe was the 10th release, 10th or 11th release of the entire book series, but you can actually safely read it probably at the very earliest after book five. Most people wait until after book seven and I really don't remember what order I read it in when I originally read the whole series. But I love this story of how they meet. And it is a true story, or at least according to the prequel, it's a true story. Despite the fact that Moraine implies that she lied about everything else about land when she's about to leave him and make him go to Alana. The most interesting thing about that to me is that she says that she lied. So either she did lie or she didn't lie, but somewhere in there, there is a lie, which means that the oath rod is not being effective. We know that Aes Sedai can disguise the truth, but that oath rod bond usually makes them have to tell at least a version of what is true. So was this to further emphasize the fact that she has no connection to the one power right now? I suspect that's what it was for. It'd be very interesting to see because I thought that if you were using the one power on someone, such as with the Oath Rod, even though I guess it's kind of a terror on Grial, but I thought you couldn't resist that whether you were susceptible to magic or not. So I have a question about that and feel free to contact me with any of your thoughts about any of the book reader stuff. You can send posts to Bust Blockbuster on Elon Musk's X 
or you can send emails to me, mattsaudioblog at gmail.com. I'm not going to give the double P stuff here because I, Bubba right now is not a book reader and I don't want anybody spoiling him on any of that stuff. You can also find Priscilla at Priscilla TV one on YouTube. She doesn't have any other social media except maybe a Tumblr, but I didn't exactly get that URL. I'll have to get it from her for next time so that we can post it in there so you can see what she's posting about. Anyway, I want to know what you think about that one little slip in line that I thought was really clever to say something, but I'm not sure what it's saying. And here is something else about that particular scene between Moraine and Landon, the television show, when she says, Alana will take your bond by force. Now, I couldn't even talk about this with Priscilla because it happens, I believe, in book six. I think it's, yeah, book six in Lord of Chaos, where Alana does bond to Rand by force. It's a very disturbing passage in the book. There are many disturbing passages in the books, but that one I found particularly weird because while Jordan does do a lot of, you know, women folding their arms under the breasts to hold them up, basically, and I have no idea what it is with writers' fascinations with mammary glands, but the idea of compulsion, which is something that Leandrin will use probably, or we know that Mogadin uses it a lot, or this forced bonding is really disturbing. Like I said, there's many things, and I could spend the entire podcast just listing on all of those, but I love that allusion to Alana bonding to Rand from the books that was very subtly placed in the show. So I guess from here, I'll just go through the episodes and do some comparisons I like the change of switching out Varen for, was it Van Deen? Van Dene? I can't remember how you pronounce her name. But Adelaus, or Adelise, however you say that one, originally had another sister that started with a V that was at that house where Moraine visited to find out more about the prophecies. And of course, the whole stipulation that she couldn't go back to the One Tower nor be able to channel at this point wasn't present in the books i don't have any problem with that storyline they got to give maureen something to do because she is kind of inactive this book the great hunt so got to give your lead actress some kind of storyline that's emotionally compelling and that works for me but having varin there instead allows them to consolidate some characters first of all and of course introduces a very important character for the book series to the television series. And I honestly, you have to help me out with this again, book readers, was Varen always part of the Black Aja and Tomas a dark friend? I know that that comes up quite a bit later in the series after Egwene is already the Amaralyn seat, but I can't remember when the change occurs or if it had already occurred. It just makes me wonder if they're bringing Varen in now in this way, could she possibly have been that Black Aja that was at the Dark Friends social? The other possibilities, of course, uh, Joya Bayer or Leandrin, I suppose. Since we don't really get a context within the six month period between the end of season one and the beginning of season two, it's difficult to determine when exactly this Dark Friends social occurs so any of those possibilities could be true and what about Varen and moraine's conversation in episode two which also points to those kinds of things where moraine says she needs an oath of allegiance or what have you like that and then Varen says what do you want me to take an oath to that i won't betray you there's loopholes to every oath and with Varen. I believe that that is definitely the case. And I think that that was an illusion to us book readers to say, yes, we know what we're doing. Yes, we're on track. Yes, we're going to play Varen's story out. And that's why you have such a great actress playing this role. As a book reader, I am so delighted with the lesson that Egwene and Nynaeve got 
in the tower from Alana, which explains the, the five divisions of the one power. And I love how they have now created the weaves to accentuate what's being used. I thought that was a great stroke because Jordan does have some very specific rules about the magic, some of which I feel like the show is kind of breaking as far as Logan goes, but that's just me. But at least now visually we have something to tell us more of what these sisters are doing rather than just these white whisks. And I suppose that Rafe was simply trying to keep it simple the first season until he could explain it. And there's no better way or opportunity to explain it until you get to one of our main characters learning about it or two of our main characters learning about it. Oh, oh, I want to go back to Egwene because Priscilla and I do talk about this quite a bit in relation to her not using her hands and talking about it in the context of the show because of Child Valda. But the other thing that's book related, of course, is that Egwene spends a good deal of time with the Aiel wise ones and they don't use their hands when they channel either. Let's talk about Elias for a moment as of course as you know he actually first met up with Perrin and Egwene in book one after they had gotten away from Shadar Logoth and so I missed having him there during season one they're kind of making up for it here in season two I'm still not completely pleased I feel like their relationship may be just budding and I understand he's just being hired on as a tracker replacing the other Shinaran that was a tracker in the Great Hunt that had some kind of similar abilities, I guess. It makes sense to consolidate it into that. I just didn't like the delay, and I wish that they had more interactions because here Elias is, he's got golden eyes all the time. You would think that Perrin would ask him questions, but instead he wants to avoid him. I guess he wants to avoid that part of himself. Another nice little Easter egg regarding Elias is his sword, which in a couple of shots you can see the hilt of. And of course, that's how Elias's wolf name comes into being. He is called Longtooth by the wolves. And with that white handle and everything, I thought they did a really good job of, of nodding to his wolf name if you knew what to look for. And as I mentioned in the non-book reader review, I really loved Perrin's speech about revenge and all of that over the graves. I think that does de definitely point directly to the berserker type scenario. And I may have been a little loose with my spoiler implications about Perrin's fetish with murder, but I do love the contrast of learning what he did from the Tuathlon and of course, we know how that affects him in the Shadow Rising when he returns to Emmons Field. But I certainly hope we, that we get more interactions and Perrin learning more. Once again, that whole bit of how Perrin is using his wolf senses to see what happened was really well done, in my opinion. I really liked it. How did you feel about it? Let me know. Matt's audio blog at gmail.com or you can tweet to pardon me, you can send posts to my X account at Bust Blockbuster. Let's talk about Bail Doman, the captain. I really missed not having the boat scenes going down to Whitebridge with Tom Marilyn and Rand and Matt and Bail. But I'm so glad that they did mention the fades at Whitebridge. Nice little book nod, getting it back, as I mentioned in the non-book reader friendly review. The question is, will he end up in Faldara and agree to help Nynaeve and Elaine and all of them, even though that doesn't really work out? And if they carry out like the Tanchico storyline and those kinds of things from later books later on in the series... Uh, I hope we get this same guy back because I really liked him as that character. I don't know if I'd say that it was an exact kind of portrayal, but I can per picture this guy being bailed him on from the books. Uh, there's lots of interesting stuff that's going to happen in Tanchico and all of these other things. So hopefully 
this guy's in for the long haul. Or at least hopefully they'll portray some of that stuff. I honestly, with this adaptation, the way they're throwing things in from the prequel, from all of these other later books, I honestly just have no earthly idea what they're going to carry on in the series or not. Because it's just too much. They have to cut some storylines out. So my guess is pretty worthless. You saw how in my season two predictions podcast through the first four episodes, how off I already am. Even though everything that I said was true, they've chosen a different and likely much better way to tell this story. So here's something that I don't really get. And that is, I mean, it's true to the books. Egwene is very uptight about sex about all things sexual, even the the way somebody rides a horse, whether they ride it with their skirt split open or not, uh, that's some of the most humorous stuff in the book. And it also makes me just want to go, oh, we're going to get a life. But that scene with Alana, where she was so uptight about Alana thinking that she was talking about sex and that it was just about the weave itself, that's very typical of Egwene. Yet in season one, since they'd aged him up, I suppose, I thought it had been implied that Egwene and Rand had had sex before being completely committed, before being married. So the two don't really jive. Is this kind of a reset of Egwene's character? Or is it something that still makes sense because Rand is gone? Now she's all of a sudden uptight about sex. I don't really care one way or the other. I just find the continuity a little puzzling. I love the fact that they've kept it true that you just really have to piss Nynaeve off in order to, for her to be able to channel. That's great. Uh, hopefully we'll see more tugging of the hair braid as we go along uh, that she uses to make herself angry or see her shout at people for no reason just to make herself angry enough to be able to channel. And I can't wait to talk about the episode three stuff. We talk a little bit about it with Priscilla, but I want to save most of my book reader talk that goes beyond the third book to the next book reader podcast episode. At any rate, Leandrin was the perfect foil for that. And she obviously, because Nynaeve is the most powerful, I guess possibly to recruit her to the Black Aja, or at least to the dark side. Just as Bubba said in our NBR podcast, but what a great display of power there. Loved it. Love that they showed the shielding, although it didn't look as similar to the way that they shielded Loghain. It didn't look the same way as it had the effect on Moraine, all that from season one. And could they bring in the fact that Nynaeve ends up restoring Loghain a little bit, restoring Swan and, and Leanne? Could they find a way to do that for Moraine if she truly is cut off? But she wouldn't be nearly as powerful, as I recall from the books. If that's the case, they bring them back, but they don't have near the power that they once had. So I'm still holding out for the fact that Moraine is just shielded somehow, and then it's been tied off. And maybe none of the other Aes Sedai can see this because it was a male channeler that did this. That would make sense as well. We'll just have to see. Priscilla and I will talk about Inktar quite a bit in the next section. Uh, but just again to point out the way that he's trying to just throw in a little bit of sympathy for Pat and Fane to Perrin of all people. Not a good choice. But it clearly points the way for him being a dark friend. In fact, he may have been one of those at the dark friend social Perhaps while Loyal was still recovering because he's Loyal had to recover from that stab. He was even if it wasn't the Shatter Logoth blade, it still has to be or have been quite deadly. As far as the way that they're handling the land story, I'm cool with that. Her sending Lan away to Alana is interesting. I believe it's Morel that Land's bond is transferred to when Moraine actually goes through the door with Lanfear in, what book is that? Fires of Heaven? But if they're going to do Alana, I mean, 
that would work. I obviously they're not probably not going to do any kind of transfer here. Do you think they'll actually kill Moraine? Do you think they'll actually have her go through the door in the series? I almost feel like they have to do that. It will certainly wow a TV only audience if they do it. I suppose we would have to have a Beltine ceremony for her as well or have her included in the ceremony. I did love that. I loved that sequence of everybody celebrating, celebrating, mourning Beltine. And I loved the fade fight, the double F. Those are great sequences that I don't recall from the books. I don't think they're part of the books, but they were they were fantastic as well. And before I move on to episode two, I do want to go back. I want to give uh, John from the What Up channel on YouTube uh, credit for this because I missed it. And then I watched his video and he pointed it out. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. What Up channel is a channel you should watch. The Dusty Wheel, of course, is a great channel for and podcast for Wheel of Time. Uh, Wheel of Time with Allie and Gus is another one. Sorry, these are all people that you probably already listen to if you are a book reader, or if not, if, if you happen to stumble upon me, uh, you're going to find out that there are people that cover this stuff a heck of a lot better than me, but that's beside the point. I'm just here doing what I do. Anyway, John pointed out two things about the scene of Egwene cleaning the Amarillo Seats chambers, and I loved both of these. The first one I completely missed. The second one I kind of suspected, but I'm glad it he confirmed his belief about what it means as well. First, let's look at as Egwene is cleaning the chamber. On the desk, you see this blue box, and it's kind of got some symbols from Tyr, uh, that kind of symbolism on it. It's a wonderful little blue box, but John believes, and now I also believe, that that's the box that all of the letters and all of the communications go into that you know swan keeps in or that the amerlin keeps in all those correspondences in and as you recall when they're in telling our is that how you say that forgive me but as like Egwene or nynaeve or elaine are all in that dream world they often go through that box in order to keep up with what's happening at the white tower and there's all kinds of little tricks about it because if you look at it for too long or if you don't concentrate on it hard enough then it disappears and it goes back into its place because that's the way the dream world works all kinds of rules there if you're a book reader and you've read that far then you know and if you haven't read that far then i don't want to spoil any more for you but there is times when Egwene will travel through that world and, and read through some of that the second thing that john pointed out and this is the one that i also suspected but when she takes a long look at the stole for the Amerlin. That's a direct foreshadowing to us, of course, of Egwene eventually becoming the Amerlin. It's a ways down in the story if you haven't read that far, but it is something that's really interesting. I love how they're pulling these little kind of Easter eggs out of the story from later on and introducing them in these earlier seasons so that people who then go back and rewatch the series can say, oh yeah, I see that as foreshadowing now. Otherwise, it probably doesn't mean much to you if you don't know the fact that Egwene becomes the Amerlin. But anyway, I wanted to point those two out again. What Up Channel, W-O-T Up Channel is John's channel and he does a fabulous job covering all things regarding the Wheel of Time, books, spoilers, sets, all kinds of great news and information. I suppose the last thing for this episode, going back to those scenes with Moraine and the Fades, one thing that we got out of that was the fact of the Fades' abilities to disappear into the shadows, to seemingly go in one place and then suddenly be in another. That's something that we hadn't seen done before in the series, and I like how they've brought those abilities into this season, given that they didn't focus on that at all in the first season. Let's move on to episode two here. And I guess the most logical place is to start with Rand because his story is maybe uh, outside of Moraine's is the most different from any of the other character journeys so far in comparison to the book. Rand is in a completely different place because he started out at Faldara with everybody else 
in book two, and then the Pat and Fane thing happened, and then he went on his own journey. The bit with Celine actually happened through a portal world, as opposed to directly in Carrionan. And as far as that goes, this patient that he's seeing uh, was a veteran of the war between the Aeol and the Carrionan, which of course is alluded to a lot in the books and why the Aeol still to this day look very much with disdain upon those from the Carrionan because of the tree. If you haven't gotten that far in the books, Sorry to have spoiled it for you, but there is a long-standing feud, and I thought that was really illustrated well with this carrion and patient. On top of that, we know that Rand, while he's still at Faldara, learns a lot of sword forms actually from Lan. And since Lan isn't there, what better idea than to have Rand sneak in his own sword so that this Heron Mark's sword blade master can teach him forms he's not going to get them from land he can get them from this guy now in the regular podcast i always do this bit where i try to hate on rand and i use this as an excuse it's like he's using this guy in actuality the story needed something to replace that sword training from land and so this is as good as any other method and whether you think rand is using this guy or not i think that you can see that he does have a decent heart in the way that he takes care of the guy regardless of what he's going to get out of it so yes my hate for rand is actually a bit which bubba hates but he'll just have to get over it because i'm going to continue to do the bit but i love these forms that we get we get several forms we get cutting the clouds we get kissing the adder parting the silk and reaping the barley, all of these great sword forms that we know that he has to know by the time that he faces Turok in Falma. So it's wonderful that he can get the training here. Maybe because it seems eventually that Moraine and Rand's paths are going to cross again, maybe Lan will once again join them and teach him even more forms and help him train in them. But even if we don't get that, which would have, was another prediction that I had that may possibly be wrong, even if we don't get that, at least we know that Rand has been learning some of the forms. Another big change really from the books is the fact that because of this difference of what's happened to him and him deciding that he wants everybody to think that he's dead, Rand is actually approaching all of this with like a real plan. Which, in book two, Rand is pretty much running scared, but he's running straight into danger as he's running scared. And it's through the portal world, which I don't know if we're going to get the portal world or not this time around, or ever get portal stones. Maybe we will. Maybe the Rudian thing will reveal the portal stones. Maybe he'll use them to get to Falma, him and Moraine and land but i'm pretty sure that we've seen shots of them near a way gate or at least moraine and land so i don't know if that's going to happen or if the portal stones will ever happen nonetheless that's where he encounters Celine, and instead now Celine is already in carrion and please forgive me i'm going to pronounce a lot of these names wrong i want you other book readers who have been pronouncing these names for 20 years to come back at me and and phonetically spell them out to me and say hey matt get it right uh, you can send your emails to matt's audioblog at gmail.com m-a-t-t-s audioblog at gmail.com or you can send a post to my ex social account i'll never get used to that i just want to say tweet me at bust blockbuster but send your book thoughts in to me as well and we'll include them in a separate feedback section in the book sections that we do I'm not planning on having separate book podcasts and TV only podcasts all season, but because we're covering two episodes in these first two weeks a piece, I figure it was better to just completely separate them out so that you can just skip over the book reader ones if you want, or the non book reader ones if you want. Back to Celine, real quick. I want to talk about the fact that she's, when she's in bed with Rand, she says, you know, he's trying to forget Egwene. She says that she's basically trying to remember 
the lover that hurt her, and that, of course, was Luz Theremin, and she's directly remembering Rand. Yes, put it together. Celine is Lanfear. Uh, just as Bubba suspected that she's a dark friend, she's actually much more than that. But I want to get to Celine in just a little bit. I want to put that on the, the t side of the table here, and I want to move on to Nynaeve real quick. One of the things that I love, it's kind of weird that Leandrin is the one that introduces her to this mostly, but because she has been a wisdom, and I loved her defiantly wearing her wisdom belt in episode one of this season, over the white garment, drinking the water, all that stuff, that was great. But her true interest, even as a wisdom, was in healing people, and now she's seeing this be being done with break bones, fever, which is was a wonderful callback to how actually it seems that Nynaeve passed abilities with the one power to Egwene. Egwene had break bone fever when she was little, and somehow that's how Egwene possibly got the power. A wonderful nod, but here she sees this girl with break bones fever being healed, and it points towards the direction that Nynaeve wants to go. The yellow Aja are usually the healers, and that's what Nynaeve aspires to be throughout most of the books. In the course of doing some healing actual experimentations, she ends up reconnecting Loghain with the One Power to a certain extent, and she ends up connecting Swan and Lien back to the One Power, although none of them are nearly as powerful now, as far as Rand goes, of course, his end goal is to get into Loghain, and we see that at the end of this episode, and then we see that further carried out through episode three. And I had originally posed that perhaps they were going to combine Loghain with Asmodian and with Mazram Taim, or Mazram Taim. Again, correct me on these pronunciations. But as it turns out, Mazram Taim is actually mentioned during that meeting with Alana and Shiriam and Alana's two warders as a dragon reborn or a false dragon reborn. And so they can't combine him with Loghain in that way. So that prediction's totally out the window as well, which makes perfect sense because I'm so good at them. But I do love that. If Nynaeve does heal Loghain, if they get this timing all right, Maybe Loghain can fill the Asmodian role. They're only going to have eight Forsaken, as far as I can tell. There are symbols in the scene that was released before the season started of Ishmael seemingly freeing Lanfear. And there were eight triangles on that seal, which I think represent each of the Forsaken that'll be in the show, simply because we saw the, that kind of break, a little bit of Quindiar kind of break off of one of those triangles, and then all of a sudden, lo and behold, there is what I suspect will be Lanfear. Interesting that we didn't actually see this scene yet, but we have Selene in Carrianon already. So things might be placed a little bit out of time, or maybe the scene was cut entirely. I'll discuss more of this with Priscilla. But given that they actually released it, I can't see how, unless they said, oh, here's some bonus content, it must be in the show somewhere. I just don't understand how we're going to see it if Celine is already in Carrianon. Because as we know, Landfear takes on many different kinds of personas to try to get to Rand uh, because she is totally in love with Luce Theron. I've already talked extensively about Nynaeve and the Leandrin thing and the Sun thing, the man in North Harbor. Still don't know whether Moraine understands who that relation is to Leandrin, but I loved that. Now, I do not recall anything like that from the books, so that must be brand new and stuff that Rafe put in just because you have a wonderful actress like Kate Fleetwood playing this role. Give her some real meat, and man, did they. So if that is, in fact, a change, as I suspect it is, then that was a wonderful change. I absolutely loved that. We talked about that extensively in our non-book reader section because even Bubba picked up that Leandrin had said, you know, Aes Sedai can live for hundreds of years. And then Leandrin calls this man my boy. And obviously 
he is her son, which changes Leandrin's age considerably from the books, and I'm all here for it. Let's talk about Matt, because I haven't really talked about Matt yet. I like this storyline. I, you know, because of whatever happened with Barney Harris or with COVID or what have you, they couldn't have Matt be in Faldara to participate with Perrin in that part of the journey, but he's got to get to Faldara somehow. We've seen him in the trailer, perhaps with the staff that he got, you know, he got it by going through one of those doors and then nearly ended up dying or maybe even did die. I think that's in Fires of Heaven. I know he walks through one door at the tower and he walks through the other door in Rodian. So I know the Rodian thing was Fires of Heaven. And I love that they've paired up men being there. Men's been in the in and out of the tower before. Uh, and when we talk about episode three, we can talk about even more significant changes as far as that goes. But I love that she is his cellmate. I said in the season one podcast that men is one of my favorite characters. And of course, Baba looked at me cross-eyed because she didn't really seem like a very major character at the time to him, other than her abilities and being able to tell kind of who the Dragon Reborn actually was. I love that they're pairing Min and Matt up together. These two actors have great chemistry and it should create some humorous and volatile situations from time to time, as far as I can tell. On top of that, with Matt, they've really refreshed his character. I had no problem with the way Barney Harris was playing Matt Cawthon. I think that it was wonderfully done. I think that he did what was written for him very well. But this Matt that we see in the show for these two episodes is the Matt that I think of. Defiant, funny, conniving. And yeah, a little bit in the dumps, but not nearly to the extent that they had Matt written in season one. And I think that this change is great. And I think Donald Finn is probably the better actor for this part. I'm glad we finally got the just almost like a complete wholesale change. One last thing that's really interesting about Min here is that vision that she sees when she's glimpsing Matt's pattern, right? And she sees him stabbing Rand. I can't tell if it's with the blade or not. I wonder if it's more of a metaphor that if Matt does re-encounter the blade or is not able to resist the blade, that that will mean the end of Rand. Now, I don't guess men would know that everybody else thinks that Rand is dead. Matt certainly would think that Rand is dead because it's probably been mentioned in the letters, although Leandrin's been reading them to him, so maybe he doesn't know. But of course, since Min does know Rand and does know he's the Dragon Reborn, this might be a very concerning glimpse that she had. And of course, once again, when we get into episode three, I'll talk a little bit more about that. One of the things about Min from the books that I always found a little frustrating was the fact that there was all the symbolism in what she was seeing. So I'm trying to interpret that here, but I do love the fact that they do make these things almost more visual and literal than they do in the books. That way it's much more intentional. Even if there is symbolism involved, you can really find meaning in it as opposed to having to puzzle it out until it hits you in the face when you read it later on Robert Jordan's pages. So I love that. Something else that I'm really glad that we got was the introduction of Elaine. Finally, since we didn't go to Camelin in season one, it's kind of interesting how they've reversed all of the meetings. And now we have Elaine really with the group that she spends the majority of her time with right off the bat, as opposed to meeting Rand kind of randomly in Camelin because he stumbles into the palace. And I've already gushed a lot about Elaine in the non-book reader podcast and we'll probably do so again with Priscilla but I did want to point this one thing out that I just found wonderful I talked about this just briefly but I didn't mention any names before but when Elaine tells Egwene that you know people who are their bunks are adjoined next to each other uh, the rooms are adjoined as novices uh, create great pairings. She uses Cadswain and Elena 
as examples. And for us book readers, of course, those two names are huge. I said in the non-book reader podcast how as I read the books, Elaine really sometimes gets on my nerves, uh, makes me afraid for her. And also at the same time, I adore her and I'm team Elaine all of the time. Sarah Covney is doing such a wonderful job bringing this character to life. The aloofness, the diplomacy, and the overall stand up for others as evidence when she says, if anyone needs to be punished regarding the stuff in my room, I'll take the punishment as opposed to the sister that let the maids in. Love that. And before I get into my discussion with Priscilla here, uh, one last thing to mention is Etwan's Mill, which I think is how you pronounce it. Again, let me know. And give me any of your book thoughts. Once again, mattsaudioblog at gmail.com or bust blockbuster on that one social media site that used to be Twitter. But it's my understanding, if I remember right, and it's been a while since I read The Great Hunt, to be perfectly honest, but it doesn't the group just go in there after the Sean Shan has been attacked or has attacked the place. Um, and you put that together with the fact that Pat and Fane is actually at that dark friend social and that Ishmael is with the Sean Shan, which we find out in the third episode. Do the Sean Shan already have the Horn of Valir? Has it already been turned over? Or is Pat and Fane hiding this from Ishmael? It's all very interesting, and I haven't quite puzzled all of that out yet. I don't even know that that's necessarily a book thing, but I just wanted to demonstrate that if this attack happens now, and then in the third episode we get that Ishmael is with the Shan Shan, and Pat and Fane's already been with Ishmael. Who has the horn? Okay, that's enough talking about this. Let's get to my discussion with Priscilla, which will be tampered down just a little bit. I don't think I go beyond book four or five in that one. Not quite as far as I went in the books with this one. Yeah. I had more book thoughts about the th the third episode, to be honest. But yeah. like, uh, uh, like I think we discussed about Elaine that like they were doing the the thing opposite ways now because like she's first introduced in the first book, right. and then go to Tarvalon, and, and then meet uh, uh the, she she first meets Rand, Rand. And then meets Elaine, uh, and and then uh, meets Egwene. So they are doing the opposite thing. And I wonder when she's going to meet Rand, to be honest. Well, she is going to Falma. And okay, we know Rand yeah. is going to Falma, so that would be a place where it could happen. Otherwise, the next time that they're together in the books is what? Tyr? And I don't even know if they're going to do Tyr at all uh, this season or next season. Because it seems like in season three, they're going to start picking mm -hmm. up on the Shadow Rising and everything in the Two Rivers again. Um, mm -hmm. which means they might excel Elaine's and Nynaeve's story to Fires of Heaven uh, or, or stuff in there, which I know none of this stuff means anything to you, so I won't say any more. But I still, I, even these first two episodes, I feel like they're still really emphasizing Rand's feelings for Egwene. I mean, I know he's with Celine and what have mm -hmm. you, but uh, it, it still feels like they're really glamming on to you know, this is his one true love when in actuality in the books, there are multiple women who come in and out of his lives at different times. So it, it's kind of weird that this is the the through line that they decided to keep. Maybe with the mm -hmm. Celine stuff now, they can make it so that Rand kind of gets over Egwene and they can move more towards the, uh, you know, the Elaine stuff or the or the Avienda stuff which Avienda will be showing up in this season. So, Yeah, um, but you said, like you mentioned, that you thought it was a little bit too young adult the first uh, season for you. Yeah, I, and, it felt very CW, yeah. But, it, but, like, one thing that it wasn't it was Egwene and Rand relationship. It was, like, it was an adult relationship, which... Yeah, but it was muddled, like, it was muddled by that whole does Perrin like her, does Perrin not? I mean, if there was CW stuff mixed in and all of that. No, but I have to tell you something. And um, when I first read, I really had the feeling that Perrin liked Egwene. Well, I think Rafe got that 
idea from that very same kind of notion that you did. I just don't think yeah, it should have been. I, but it, it yeah, never plays up as I, a conflict. And this played up as a conflict. Okay. Okay. You, you're making a difference there because I ask people. Well, that's even what the like, CW does. That's what I'm saying. It, it, made, yeah, it, yeah. it made it CW. No, but listen, I, I have this strong feeling when I was reading that Perry had something for Egwene. And then I asked people like from other channels that I was like getting into Wheel of Time and they were like doing like uh, the prepare, like hyping for the season one. And I was like, I like, asked, hey, um, I really think he has something for Egwene. Is that uh, I'm reading too much into it? And they all said the same thing. No, no, they're all friends. And it's just that because um Egwene is promised to Rand and Perry is being a good friend and I was like I'm sorry I didn't get that so when you went to season one and they added this level in, in their relationship that the, one the relationship was not a crush it was not like they're just being promised to each other no it was a real relationship one and two it was a complicated relationship because she has an, she had ambitions and uh, he had his, his ideas too. And then Trollocs came and three, there is Perry. Then I was like, I felt, oh my God, I understood them. So I'm not the only one that had this reading. So I actually liked the way they did the relationship and the conflict. I'm, uh, yeah, it could have been done like a little bit differently. But they, they, uh, I think they added more adult stuff there. So in this context, the season two, when Celine yeah. comes in, and in the books, it's not like that. In well, the, I, at the all. relationship is more mature in the television show, simply for yeah. the fact that the people are more mature in the books. They're much, okay. they're younger. Younger, um, yeah. So I, it feels to me like you tried to, uh, you said, I'm going to age these people up into closer to being adults or even being adults. And so therefore I'm going to bring in some adult subjects. Let's talk about, you know, cheating on your, on your boyfriend or on your girlfriend or these kinds of stupid CW jealousy issues. Matt, That's the thing that I got. Rand, Rand is not cheating on Egwene. Rand is dead. Remember no. that. No, for Rand, Egwene, Rand, 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 Rand is still alive, so therefore he no. is cheating on Egwene. Egwene could be with someone and not cheating on Rand because no, she thinks no, Rand no. is dead. Rand killed himself uh, to his friends. Yes. So he considers himself dead to his so, friends. So if I, if, let's say you and I are married, okay. and I and I tell you. <laughs> You ghost that, me. That, well, I, I send a notice to you that my plane crashed and you think that I'm dead. Then uh -huh. I go on and I and I go to another country <laughs> and I talk with uh, and date and have sex with another woman. Do you think I'm not yeah. cheating on you? No, you're dead. How can you cheat on me? <laughs> you're dead. You are dead. <laughs> All right. I'm dead. All right. So, all right. So we've, we've, I've now lost that argument, obviously. Let's talk about the big change. So we've got things already focused in Carrion. I loved, um, I think it was the third episode actually, but I love that jacket. Oh my God. That jacket is so cool. That Rand was wearing. Yeah. Um, that's, that's from, I'm uh, not from the books. Yeah. Uh, and the whole thing with, with, um, Inktar. Inktar is kind of making a case for Pat and Fane. Did you see the way he was looking so intently at Perrin when Perrin was going through that revenge thing? Because we know that Inktar is going to end up being a dark friend, right? So uh, that was really interesting that he kind of going to bat for Pat and Fane just a little bit. And in fact, I think that he is, I think that he's the Shinaran that was at the dark friend show social. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that that's my guess. I don't know. There was an Aes Sedai too. There was who is the Aes Sedai? Well, that that's a good question because I think it, and I don't know if you're there yet. Um, I think it might have been. There's Joya. the black. Aja. I think it might have been Joya, the the uh, the shaved headed Aja. You think? <gasps> um, I don't know. <laughs> and, or it could have been Leandrin. Who Ooh. brought the the child? To the Dark Friends solo show. Who, I, I think that who was the, the owner a... of the house, is what I thought. Okay. Maybe not. 
Um, that because she she was that was the woman that was sitting right next to where Ishmael was standing, right? That she mm-hmm. went to her her first. Um, so I think that this actually took place. Where does it take place in the books? Is it Amadisia? I, I can't remember geographically where it takes place in the books, but I think that the the costuming, uh, if you've ever seen that map of of how the costumers kind of pattern certain patterns and colors to certain countries in a real world mm. to go back to other countries in the in the Westlands. Uh, I think it matched up with Amadisia, the c- clothing pattern. I mean, everybody thought at first that they, they were two Athlon, but that's, they're clearly not. They're too they're they're too sophisticated to be two Athlon clothing. So I think it's more Amadisia, uh, possibly. Uh, nonetheless, uh, figuring out who all the dark friends were. And no pot of fame was there. We know a white cloak was there. We know. Uh, I think it was Inktar that was there f- for Shinar. Uh, the Aes Sedai, I think, is Joya. I think that the big change uh, to Leandrin's storyline, because I don't recall any of that kind of... I mean, even... I don't know if I recall anything even about a man. I, I thought that she was sneaking away to dark friend meetings or something. Uh, in, in When... The- when Mo- Yeah, when more said that on the first season, I assumed she was meeting Pat and Fane, actually. Yeah, that's a good guess. That was as good was a guess like, as any. It must be Pat and Fane. They are two, they are dark friends. They are yeah. like doing yeah. dark friend stuff. And Moraine had a different reading of it. Yeah. Which makes it even more interesting to me as to how they're going to set up the whole Fama situation. I, is Leander yeah. simply going to trick them to be ambushed? Or is she going to ambush them herself and then bring them there? Which that wouldn't make much sense unless, well, by having Ishmael with the Shan Shan, she could be doing it for him that way. But why, I wouldn't know. Which is a strange of uh, Leandre is that she seems very honest in her motivation so far and how she reacts, especially towards Nynaeve. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but again, I, I don't I get think, any deceit. I don't get any deceit, anything from her. Well, I, I think she truly so, wants Nynaeve to work her power. Um, but I think that she wants to acquire that power for the dark side. Okay. I, I mean, Could I think be. She, I, because, you know, just because you're dark friend doing dark things and being evil doesn't mean no, that you but, don't like the people that you you're know, working with. No, but it's like she goes to Matt and says, you should go to Egwene. She needs a friend. She gives Matt a yes, way out. That was that was very interesting. Um, you know, like this is not something like I would expect a dark friend to do. But is it all part of that same setup from I don't think so. Three? I think I don't think so. I think what I my reading was like she read she reads uh Matt for filth exactly what Matt uh how badly he has been behaving mm-hmm. so she she knows more about Matt at that point than Matt knows about himself and then she gives Matt an option hey if you go to your friend like if you go to your friend if if you prove me wrong go to your friend prove me wrong then uh, then my setup dies here then I don't need to care about you anymore. Then, like, Moraine is wrong, uh, you know, then you learn your lesson. But he doesn't. Yeah. So I think she's, like, uh, she's, like... So she comes uh, to the realization like, then that there's, he should still be watched, and that's why she has men, sets men up for that? I don't know. I mean, I mean, she's a human being, now, so she had that terrible moment, like, uh, with, with her son. Yeah. And... And she then lost Nynaeve. So she's like giving giving this guy one last chance, one last shot at a redemption in her in her eyes. Yeah. But he goes and was like, no. Then he comes back to me and is like, okay, then game is on again. Let's do it. 
that that was my reading. I don't know, but I really I really feel her honest, like being completely honest with and being like, yeah, her methods were not very good with naive, but she was very interested. I think one of the more interesting things talking about Dark Friends and Forsaken is we and this will be great for faking out an audience that doesn't have any idea, but we all know that Celine is Lanfear in the books. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but I could have sworn that that scene of Ishmael breaking the the seal and and the woman that comes up out of the ground, I assume that was Lanfear. So are we going to get a flashback to that? Or are they going to have different women portray Lanfear as there are different characters? Because you've got Celine and then there's Another couple of women, uh, there's, this is in book mm -hmm. five or four, four or five, I can't remember which. There's a, uh, a a person who sells things, who travels with the Aiel on their way to Rudian. Uh, and she is actually Lanfear, you know, mm -hmm. or uh, someone else shows up, I think, in Tear, right? In the, oh, maybe that's not in the third book. Maybe that's also in the fourth book. I can't remember. But, uh, and she is Lanfear until... There isn't ultimately a point where land fear is dispensed with a, a little, for a little while anyway. So, but I'm trying to figure out how they're going to convey that Celine is land fear. Since they missed uh, the opportunity yeah. to have Ishmael. I mean, have two scenes of, of Ishmael right in a row. Have him do the dark friend social, then have him go to the seal and, and bring up land fear. You know, it no, just, I, th it I think like it's it going to be, be out a, of order. I think Moraine already said that she fears Ishmael is out there releasing more Forsaken. So, yeah, she said that, but we haven't she seen She said it, that. And we know that a scene Yeah, exists. no, no, no. It was already established by Moraine saying that. So we are going to see the scene. That's what I'm saying. We are going to see it. I just that don't he's think doing it's that. Make any chronological sense to people who aren't book readers. We all know who she is, but I, I think um, that it's going to be end up being a failure. Do you think I like in the first season there was like this episode that it was all about Moraine. It was all like uh, from Moraine perspective. Maybe yeah. they are going to do an, an episode all all from um, Ishmael's perspective oh, Ishamayel. or Celine's. Yeah. Okay. Uh, because uh, we we are seeing a lot of Shamael, but like in bits and pieces. Yeah. So we still don't know for sure. We have a feeling of what he's up to because of Maureen. Maureen is like saying, no, he's the lieutenant. He's doing this. He's the forsaken. And his name is Shamael. He's very powerful. And he's releasing other forsaken. So she's already gave us in three episodes the, the breakdown of who he is. We already saw that he has like this alliance with Leith Suraf. So the only missy point is his relations with uh, the forsaken because we already saw him with the dark friends too. So this is all three in three episodes so i expect that we are going to see him going forward going back to see what he has been doing since uh rand released him like all okay. the all, no, all that all the pieces on the on the chess table that he's been moving from this five months six months okay. so in this sense we can see him getting left here okay that might work. I'll, I'll I'll make that judge when I see it. I just I, I feel yeah. like that that scene should have been placed earlier. That's just me. Oh maybe or maybe she's just like. Um, or maybe it's been cut. I don't know. Um, I don't know why they would use it as promotional material, but maybe it has been cut. They did that, that like with the river they did scene. That. Yeah, exactly. They did that. Yeah, and the two rivers with the whole ceremony for Egwene, they ended up taking it out. Yeah, which was like one of the big shots of the, the promo. And people yeah. were like, why? Why did they take it out? Like, the only reason uh, why I think that they haven't done that is because they released it as an individual scene also. Uh-huh. Blood media. call for blood, no? Yeah. Yes. The With the whole, and, and, and he's even saying, you know, he, he's calling her daughter of the night. And that is, of course, Landfear. Uh, yeah. When he's speaking in the old tongue there, I believe. So, uh, 
or at least that's what experts are telling me because I have no idea. I can't read the old tongue. Can you? Read I, the old tongue? I would. I would be very surprised if they don't if they don't start one at least one episode from his point of view of what he's doing. Maybe releasing many more Forsaken too. Maybe not just her, but she, she would be the first scene, and there might be a couple others. I'm just spitballing here. I'm just guessing. Anyway, anything else about these two episodes? Well, the the Sean Shane also. Well, yeah, there was a lot. We of are Sean seeing Shane. more of them. We are seeing more. Do you think, or we are seeing the the exact amount you expected? I didn't have any. I wasn't disappointed by any of it. I I okay. think it, I think they look great. Um, they are brutal. Yeah. You know, and just just to see the way that the the Sudan treat the Domani, or not even really treat them, but just the fact that uh, they're, you know, they do the motion and then the Domani, Domani do the motion, uh, you know, the sense of con absolute control is there, uh, which is, to me, visually very menacing. So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, if every time they a, are on that was a screen, heck of a magic trick, uh, blowing a hurricane through the the village like that. And they are it's, taking the the women that can channel, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, but, like they 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 found three among them in one village. Pretty well, didn't Leandrin in one in, at one point? Or maybe it was Leandrin, or maybe no, it, maybe it was Alana when she was talking to Shira. Alana. Yeah, it's saying that, you know, we're seeing more and more people with the ability come up than we had. No, I think the relation I mean, she was, was talking about men, we, but no, I think the relation was we we have less people arriving, but we are seeing people with right. more power. Right. Okay. Well, and she made a connection. Okay, we, we have been before that we have been getting less and less each year. And now we are going to now we are getting more and with more power than ever before. Yeah. So that's why it's just said that's why I think the, the last battle is coming because of this. Like it cannot be an accident that this is right. happening. Which is why it doesn't seem unreasonable to find three people in the same area. With the capability of the one power. Look, you found five Taviran in the two rivers. Yeah, but the two rivers, uh, like, is a, a reg, uh, like a place that is, like, very rich, apparently. Mm. Right? Yeah, well, I guess it's got a, it's got definitely got a history. Mm hmm. But why can't. Which uh, I, I always, I always say in Portuguese, three rivers, because there is, like, a city. In, in the my home state that is called Tree Rivers. Let's go ahead and talk about the third episode in this part. Yeah. Uno is one of my favorite characters in the in the books. And oh, shit. there Sorry. are so many fantastic stories of him traveling with Nynaeve and Elaine, primarily. Not anymore. That's gone. That's gone. That's a big butterfly effect. I wonder. Yeah. I wonder if that means that they're actually cutting some of those storylines out completely for the series. I think so. That sucks to me. Boy, what a way to go! I think so. That's awful. Talk about sexual. But, but talk, talk about stakes, because I thought Literally. Uno was like. No, nah, I thought <laughs> exactly. I thought Uno was like good, good to go. Yeah. And I thought maybe a couple of others there would take the butt, but now see him. Mm, gone. He gone. It was him. a good death. It was a good death. It was an excellent death. Um, yeah. But I just hated that it was a death at all, because I love Uno. And he only got to say feck once. It's the way, if if he had to go, that was the, the way to go. He... He was killed. He was killed in front of his companions, and oh uh, he my was ears made are an tricking example. Me. I thought you said it was cute, and I was just about. No, to... <laughs> he was cute. That's my ears. Yeah, he was That's my ears. <laughs> my bad. 
No, um, yeah, but I mean, I'm extremely impressed about Nynaeve accepted test. Yeah, that that was it, way it was better. heartbreaking. To me, that was way better than the, the chapter. I mean, I love the, the whole. We first... were talking about the chapter, and I was like, I didn't understand when I read because I was like, oh, by the way, you can stay there. Yeah, uh, take care. Okay, no, come back. You can die there. Uh, no, no. I was like, what? They were downplaying in in the in the chapter. In this one, no, they were like very fearful, and you really felt the gravity of what she was about to do. Well, she does fight a forsaken in the first one, and then you had this. The second one is kind of the same as as the one in the TV show with the with the uh, with the other wisdom that happened the, in the second. The second, the second, the second I, I left very hard because it's like obviously she was like a, that portal could not open uh, as fast as she was like basically just jumping like i have to get out, of, get here. out of here <laughs> terrible sorry and they go thank you i need for saving my son and if oh yeah yeah that was horrible <laughs> uh... <laughs> But the third one, one with Matt coming back and Perrin being oh, there, that was great. It was hilarious, yeah. Look, one thing that I'm missing is like the sense of humor of the books. It's completely I thought, gone. I thought Matt and Min did pretty good with it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah but I, I but love like seeing, this... they've reinvented Matt and they've made him more like the way I see him in the books. And I I I'm all there for it. I... I really liked, like, there were, like, I think overall, like, the se- the first season they had more humor. Yeah. Which I really liked. Uh, especially between Matt and, and Rand, when they were still good. In the first, in the, the couple of episodes, they were separated from the girls. And, like... <laughs> Wait a minute. You didn't find then, it funny uh, when Egwene was, uh, came in on Alana's threesome? I thought it was very awkward the way they did it. It was like, oh, I, I, I thought they could have milked a little bit. Mm. I'm looking you know, for things that I thought were funny in my notes. No, oh, honestly, I, mean, I thought uh, they could have you know milked. What? I, when Lan says, I think that's the first time someone in my life told me to be quiet when he says that to Thomas. I laughed yeah. so hard. And I kept thinking, you know, Lan, maybe if you'd have just not demanded hot baths or for baths to be hotter uh moraine might treat you a little better uh, than she's treating you in these episodes let's see where's another lol no you're yeah right. but not that I, much in there i did you see me like min and matt it was a very good uh i wouldn't say comic relief because it was a levity they were like yeah, it really was lighter long. it was definitely lighter. it was lighter but but humor, humor, uh, I think the Alana bit that you said, I think it fell a bit flat for me okay. if, because of the actresses. I just, they, 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 I just, thought, Egwene, I just thought that Madeline uh, playing Egwene, the shock and the horror and everything, because I think of Egwene as just being that uptight all the time when I read the books. Yeah. And so uh, that just tickled me maybe just because of her reaction to it more so than what was actually going on. No, but I think Alana, I, I don't know. I don't know what, honestly, what she could have done differently. But I, I think if they would have placed her in a in a position where she was not that relaxed, mm. where she could where she could explain to Egwene in a straight face, then it would have been funnier. Like if she's behind the desk, oh no, you just you just do this and this, and then it's all good. But no, she was already like very like sexual, as essentially uh, eating and like oh yeah. So it was clear for me that she was talking about sex, you know. Right, right, yeah. Because the one, joke that one didn't hit me at all. I just exactly did. that's what yeah. I'm saying. But that that's perhaps uh, uh, the it sh- the scene should have been directed in another way. One thing that has to happen is we've seen in the trailer that Avienda saves Perrin from white cloaks and i think that that happens before falma before falma obviously because they seem to be there together so um with masima so 
I, I think this is an out of the frying pan into the fire deal where he, Perrin is running from the Shan Shan and running straight into the White Cloaks, who surely have gotten word from Child Valda about. Uh, I think you got it. I think you got it. Yeah, I think that's exactly what is going to happen. Because Child Valda will never forget Perrin. And Child Valda, and we are not never going to forget Child Valda. He was hilarious. Child Valda. Wasn't he? He was hilarious. I mean, see? Well, he was I'm hilarious, but I don't think he was supposed to be. I think he was supposed to be hilarious. Okay. I think so. Yeah. Top, huh? I thought that people were supposed to fear him. And it ended up being just backfiring <laughs> because it was too over the top. It was so funny, like the the torture that he was torturing. Uh, There's Perry. nothing funny about cutting a no, woman's hands no. off and burning her alive. There's nothing Le funny about that. Lisa, he was torturing Perry, and he was making fun of Gwen and the, the balls that she managed. The little, the little, the little bit of yeah. yeah, and he was like, "Ha ha ha! You're terrible!" Oh, blah. And he didn't even realize that she was doing like uh, something on the back. That like she was just like, "Hey, see here!" Like when she was just fainting. One <laughs> of the things that I loved was Gwen when they first tried to do the water weave. To, to clean the water she won't use her hands and it reminded me of the fact that she was trying that time in tarval and she was having to try and use the one power without being able to move her hands so yeah yeah i loved i love the fact that she's like you know let me Trauma. learn how to do it without my hands that'll just make it when i have my hands free easier uh mm -hmm. so i i love that continuity there that was fantastic Child found oh my God. Yeah, we're gonna end on that. Going to... We're gonna end it. Just say Child Valda three times, ladies and gentlemen. Child Valda. Child Valda. Child Valda. Yes. She's at Priscilla TV One on YouTube. I'm at Musical Concepts on Twitter. If you have thoughts or feedback, please feel free to send it to it at Bust Boss Bus at Bust Blockbuster wherever you're on social media or at the word double letters phq same and you can send emails to matt's audio blog at gmail.com see ya to Matt's audio blog at gmail.com and find all back episodes and other information at Matt's audioblog.com. Part of Double P Media, doublepmedia.com.